Good day, Felix. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what, where you live and where you work, what you do, and perhaps some of the more interesting things you've worked on in your career. Fantastic question, and what a mouthful. Hey, Guy, how are you? Thanks for having me here. Uh, so I recently moved from the city of Concord, North Carolina, to the countryside of Concord, and it has been an awesome six weeks. Awesome. I'm still unpacking. Uh, my wife and I are just thrilled to be living in a quiet environment. Um, I can say a mouthful, and I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, but I just love life uh, for everything that it has to offer. I wake up uh, knowing that there's going to be a bump in the road sooner or later, but it's a challenge that I receive with the open arms. I'm a retired uh, postal inspector of 26 years, and guess what else? I'm a retired Army Reserve Command Sergeant Major of 26 years. So um, in terms of the contribution that I hope to make today, there's a lot of opportunity for me to talk about organizational effectiveness and organizational change and behavior and all those contributing things that I've acquired over the years uh, accidentally. In my uh, 26 years as a postal inspector, before I get into my consulting practice, I think I could never hold a job, Guy, because I was known as a troubleshooter. And anything that needed to be done uh, that was exciting and interesting and that would uh, give uh, management an opportunity to see the, my skill set, I would always be called. There was a case towards the, uh, the latter part of my career before asking to go into the violence interdiction team that I worked on with the Secret Service that involved the theft of mail for the purposes of stealing. Remember the cards called ATM cards? Mm -hmm. Well, Citibank started those many years ago, and uh, the people who would steal the mail would steal the mail sacks of mail from the city storage boxes just looking for ATM cards. Well, there was so much money associated with it to the tune of almost $10 million dollars and about 36 people that were arrested around the country, including St. Croix and St. Thomas, uh, that the U.S. Attorney in both the Eastern District and the uh, Southern District of New York said, okay, that's enough, that's enough. We pretty much got the message. Everybody understands that it's taboo. You can't mess with the United States Postal Service. Uh, that was an exciting case. Um, in my consulting practice, the exciting cases are really the ones that uh, live up to my desires of providing management, that is client management, information that helps them improve their ability to provide for a safe and secure workplace by understanding root causes, contributing factors that uh, impede that ability. And so when I go in to do an incident assessment or a threat assessment, before the, the, uh, the crime is committed or the incident is committed or after, I want to know root cause. What caused someone to want to get so angry that they would throw a tool at you? You know, what caused someone to get so angry that they would uh, put their foot on the brake and simulate attacking you with their vehicle with their foot on the accelerator? And invariably always went back to some situation that was a perception of the perpetrator's mindset that made him or her feel they were being picked on. And then further exacerbate that with the, their reality or perception of their reality that nobody cared about them, they only cared about discipline. And it takes me to this last point. So if management really, really, really wants to um, create an environment that's safe from the violent prevention perspective, take a look at your zero tolerance. It's necessary, I get it. But with zero tolerance, it's discipline. It's very structured. And if I am your good friend guy, and I know you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and you had a problem at home with your wife, and you came to work and you threw a tool, I'm not going to drop a dime on my friend guy because he's going through some personal issues. And I'm afraid that if I do drop a dime on my friend guy, management is only concerned about the behavior, not the contributing factor. Mm -hmm. Does that sum it up pretty good for yes, you? Yes, thank you. So. Your consulting practice focuses on workplace violence prevention, is that correct? That is correct. Can you tell us a little bit how you first uh, came to human performance technology or evidence-based practices for performance improvement and how that intersects with your consulting work? 
Interesting, interesting question. Yes, it goes way, way back to my days on the newly formed Postal Security Team. It was a uniform organization that was uh, supposedly create a feeling of safety and security for the Postal Service by the presence of a uniform force. It was young and it was full of guys like me who were energetic, who brought some semblance of expertise into the organization. But the senior managers then at the time were trying to figure out the niches. How do I put these guys in the right places in this growing organization? And they figured out that I liked training, that I was a human resource kind of a guy, and not necessarily in the professional side, but just I love people. And whenever there was something to do with uh, accessing new personnel, I was brought in because I had a way with people, making them feel comfortable. When it came to identif identification of training programs, they seemed to reach out to me to be the person that would be the facilitator of that. When they had new um, need for the, the, uh, the, if you would, the marketing of the Postal Security Force, they'd find little old Felix to go out and represent them because of that ability to interact well with the, uh, with the public and the customers. So I discovered early on that it's all about how you treat people and how you look at the situation that you're in and you find the best way to make the best of every situation that you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. So it was way back to the young postal security days and I discovered I had a strength, the ability to influence the outcome by recognizing the people's strengths and weaknesses. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, who some of your biggest influences were back in the day, either people or articles or books that, uh, that helped guide you? Yes, yes. Uh, Jim Phillips uh, was a postal inspector at the time that was in charge of the, the newly formed postal security team. And Jim Phillips lived in the same building. And what a small world that we talk about cross sections and mental, in, mental intersections. He lived in the same building that my uncle lived in in Hempstead, New York. And they were in the laundry room one day talking about uh, this new uh, postal security team and and how they were looking for future leaders. And my uncle says, well, you know, it's funny you say that because my nephew, Felix, is um, in that organization, if I'm not mistaken. And Jim Phillips, the postal inspector in charge of that organization says, yes, and we have our eyes on him. He's really uh, engaging. He's uh, very, very tactful in his approach to life and situations. And we think there's a future for this young man. So Jim Phillips, uh, was very instrumental. Luke Bassett was the, the, the officer in charge of the New York Postal Security team uh, in its early early days. And, and Luke was uh, an African American with a, with a, uh, a flair about him that in, made you want to love him. He loved everybody, regardless of religion, color, and he seemed to be involved 100% in finding the best in us, and it was easy to work for a guy like that. Then there was a young young lieutenant who retired from the police department, Jack Scalisi. Jack Scalisi uh, really, really embraced me. Jack told me never to be afraid of stepping out of my comfort zone. Jack told me, don't be afraid of all of the things that are happening behind my back because people might just be envious of the opportunities that uh, I seem to attract to myself. And, and they made me realize that it was all about doing what was right, uh, not being wrapped around your limitations, but looking at your strengths. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to ask if you can give us an example of uh, a 30-second elevator speech that you might use to describe what you do. Let's, let's envision that you're at some neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor and they ask you, Felix, what do you do? What do you do? I help. I help organizations implement and manage their workplace security posture with a specialty in workplace violence prevention. That's essentially what I do. If you have your back door properly secured, you're not going to worry about someone who knows your weaknesses to come in that back door. If you do not have an appropriate policy plan or procedure in place, I will help you develop a pro an appropriate policy procedure and plan. So human performance technology, uh, evidence-based practices for performance improvement, uh, kind of begins with the ends in mind and then looks to the means. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, if your goal is uh, ending workplace violence, what are some of the means 
that uh, you employ in order to um, affect that? Recognizing responsibility, recognizing accountability, and recognizing the consequences. And tied in together, if from a behavior standpoint, if you're an employee, you should understand that the consequences are directly tied to your accountabilities. If you cross the line of civility and do not know how to manage your behavior because of whatever situation drives you to that emotional outburst, the consequences are severe. If you're a supervisor, you own all the potential consequences because you're responsible for nurturing, for leading, training, and developing your team. And your accountability suggests that if you're not the right person for that position, then you might be a contributing factor. Senior management, don't tell me it doesn't work. It, it needs your commitment, and it needs that commitment supported by your investment. And that commitment is clearly defined policies that articulate accountability, responsibility, and the consequences. If not, we're all involved in a litigious environment today where you make a mistake, I'm going to hold you accountable. So as a senior manager, if you're not understanding that it stops, it starts with you and stops with you, there's going to be a huge gap that's going to suggest you don't care, I don't care, and therefore you've given me license to act out. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this because you come to this world of human performance technology through our local ISPI chapter in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where we met. And I was intrigued with um, your interest in what the, the uh, chapter was offering and that uh, how you, coming into this from a kind of a non-traditional approach or role, uh, sees the value in a performance orientation, which is what you're all about in uh, your talk about accountabilities and consequences, etc. So yes. thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, thank you. As a lifelong learner, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, whatever you might be pursuing in terms of uh, learning? And are, are you climbing some new learning curve? on some topic or capability? I am perpetually uh, reaching out for smarter ways of doing what I do. And just to, to draw a, a, a parallelism between this, this uh, interview and how we met. And uh, it goes back to the Army and it goes back to my Postal Service career. So in the Army, so back in the Army days, back in the mid 80s, the Army developed this performance oriented training concept that enabled the civilians transitioning from the civilian mindset to really wrap their arms around learning from the application of the, the theory into the practical uh, application of technology, whether it be a truck, a radio system, or how we did things. And I found that that, that worked very efficiently because the soldier interacted with the leader and the leader was right there to correct deficiencies and really focus and help that individual overcome. And then and then in my postal service career, believe it or not, workplace violence prevention is also part of that human performance technology. We're talking about people needing to interact in a humane way, leaders and managers understanding that we're human and, and that humans bring a certain amount of baggage to workplace environments. And it's not always about disciplining people before you find out what root causes or contributing factors that lead to misunderstandings. So in moving Going over to uh, ISPI, I found it incredibly uh, validating in my life's work. I discovered that the reason why uh, civilians don't really understand workplace violence prevention is because it requires critical thinking. It requires deep learning. It requires rep repetition. And oftentimes, they're not given the time to learn it from a repetitive perspective because time is of the essence. And so I began attending these meetings and saying, oh my goodness, we have been doing the right thing. I have been trying to do the right thing. And these meetings, by its virtue of the content that's delivered, confirms that not necessarily acquiring it from a formal lesson in a school or a college or a university, life's experiences and all of those seminars and workshops relative to the topic have prepared me uh, ably to be able to understand what it's all about and how I can be more effective in helping both the victims, the perpetrators, and management as a, as a client to work through these uh, difficult challenges. Mm -hmm. 
So what are, what are you focused on right now in terms of learning? Um, is there any particular topic? Uh, and how are you going about uh, pursuing uh, acquiring uh, new insights, new knowledge? Another great question. So I'm doing two things simultaneously that are research driven. I'm writing more. Uh, we've designed a, a blog that I call a blog on my website that takes a look at recent incidents and then tries to analytically provide insight into the causation uh, of the incidents to try and continue the education process. I've also written an ebook that I'm in the process of updating from the standpoint of making the content more consumable uh, and, and more you know, reader friendlier in, in terms of its design. And so I think both will continue to harness the potential that is out there in uh, improving my uh, ability to see with greater clarity what the issues may be, uh, some of the data that affects the issues, and help organizations realize that while it's important to acquire statistics from outside of the organization, how familiar, you, how familiar are you with what's going on in your own organization? So before you quote some federal government or state agency, how about quoting your own data in terms of the assessment you may have done internally to figure out why you might be having particular problems. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's go back to some of your, uh, back in your early days here, probably back to the Army and Postal uh, uh, Security uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any stories of, uh, of people and incidences that uh, were meaningful to you that, that might be appropriate to share with our audience? Yes, yes. When I was a, an instructor on the, on the national training team down at the Basic Training Academy, I discovered that because I didn't go into that environment immediately as a younger inspector, that, um, that the experience that I acquired over the years allowed me to be more mature in not being judgmental about the lack of awareness or the lack of understanding of how to implement the training content that we were delivering. And I found that if you relax the uh, the young inspectors and the young postal police officers in the understanding that it was a learning mode as opposed to an accountability mode, that the acquisition and retention of the information went a long way. And I remember particularly on the firearms range, females always seemed to take on firearms qualification a lot more uh, open than men did particularly the men who came with experience in thinking just because they shot a long, a long a white, a rifle or a shotgun that it was equivalent to firing a handgun. Um, and I found that the, the women taught me something about paying attention. They paid attention. Whereas us males, our egos always got in the way and we always felt that our past experiences uh, will be sufficient to carry us through. And in the end, the women fared very, very well, scoring high in their in their weapon, weapons training program, marksmanship, marksmanship uh, sharpshooter expert, and I and I I attributed that to the fact that they were open and receptive to the to information, especially information that they weren't aware of, and I found that significant because when you're in a security environment and decisions are predicated on what you do to minimize risk to others you got to be able to take in before you give up, give out. And that taking in process is important because you file it for when you need it. If you brush it off as something you don't need because you've already did that in the past, it may not keep you out of trouble in the future. It's almost like critical thinking. How you look at situations now as it relates to the now as opposed to the yesterday could make a critical could make a critical decision become a bad decision if you fail to adopt for the moment. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Um, I guess my last question is, do you have any uh, words of wisdom or guidance for people who perhaps are new and entering the field of uh, human performance technology through either learning and development or training and development? And there's uh, many different practices within yes of human performance technology, but for new people, what, what's your guidance for them? Um, let's take it from the standpoint of being a consultant or an advisor to an organization. 
is try to understand what the organization is, what their posture is, and what the issues might be that directly relate to the services that you intend to offer before you start telling what to do. Assess and evaluate uh, from your standpoint what it is that might be contributing to the causation of ill will or the the causation of problems before you start letting somebody know how much you know. In order to be effective, you must understand what makes your client ineffective. And in order to be effective, you must understand your strengths and your weaknesses. And sometimes we, we, uh, we dwell on our strengths and forget to sit back and listen to make the the weaknesses go away. So I would say dispel myths, go in prepared to have a conversation as opposed to lecturing clients. Learn from the standpoint of how could you make inroads today that will create a mental intersection in the hearts and minds of your clients for tomorrow so that when they have a need, they think of you and not somebody else. Always plan for the future and not for the present. Very good, thank you. Those are, uh, that's good guidance. Felix, again, thank you so much for doing this interview with me, and uh, I hope you have a great day. And thank you for the opportunity, Guy. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.